Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Fourth of July. Happy Independence Day. So glad that uh, you all made it with us. Uh, for those of you that set off fireworks, do we still have all of our fingers and toes? That's the question I want to know. Everybody's still intact. That's a good thing. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed time with your family, enjoyed time together. I know we have a lot of folks uh, who are out traveling. If you're with us online, we'd like to say welcome to you this morning. So glad that you're with us, uh, whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube or watching through our church website. Welcome. We're so glad. And those of you in the sanctuary, good morning as well. Uh, as always, uh, for giving, if you'd like to give to the church and continue your tithes and offerings, you can go to our church website and you're able to hop in there online and be able to give your tithes and offerings there. And other information that we have about the church is located there and we put announcements up on Facebook as well. So glad to have you all with us uh, this morning. One thing we'd like everybody to know is we do have an announcement from David Boland, uh, the chairman of the deacons. And so he's going to come and talk to you guys this morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you this morning worshiping. On behalf of the Deacon Council, the safety team, and staff, we want to provide you with an update of where we are as a church in our continuing worship. While we're at our fifth Sunday today of returning to worship in person, we continue to encourage social distancing, ask you continue to refrain from hugging and handshakes, and we continue to encourage following CDC guidelines for everyone's safety for wearing face coverings, hand washing, and the use of hand sanitizer. Although today we have started to return some adult Sunday school activities, we'll provide, provided for, we encourage the same safety measures as with our meeting for worship, including seating arrangements. Since opening, we've had a greater emphasis on weekly cleaning, including specialized sanitizing efforts in our facilities for seating and carpets to eliminate the potential for the virus remaining after the use. While we're still not providing children Sunday school and activities, we continue to evaluate weekly our ministry opportunities and remain flexible, but mindful of recommended safety guidelines. We have started providing again, as of today, weekly bulletins. After researching and speaking to several health professionals, we as a whole agree presently we should not have corporate singing in our enclosed spaces. We are considering other possibilities for gathering outside with enhanced spacing to enable us to sing in a safer manner. We are grateful for those who continue to join us online, by other means, and miss each of you. We look forward to the day when we can all safely meet again together as a church family. We very much respect each individual's decision and how we continue to join together in worship, online, in prayer, and outreach. We are thankful for our staff, pastors, and many volunteers who have continued to serve our church faithfully. We have been blessed and are thankful for everyone's continued financial support of our church. Your prayers are coveted and have certainly been felt through this difficult time. We know the Spirit is with us, and we truly look forward to the day that we can safely return to normal worship activities. May God bless each of you and your families. Jehovah Nissi means the Lord is my banner. Moses and the Israelites in Exodus 17 fought a very famous battle with the Amalekites. They had just been freed from slavery in Egypt, and now the Amalekites stood between them and God's promise. As long as Moses held his hands up high, Israel prevailed. And of course, says he got tired, his hands would lower, and then the Amalekites would prevail. So Moses ends up sitting down on a stone, and Aaron and Hur get on either side of Moses. They hold his arms up high, and in the end, eventually, Israel prevailed. When this was over with, Moses built an altar, and he called it Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. Banners have been used throughout history to unite people together. They become a symbol of a movement or a people. We in this nation have a banner we call our Old Glory, or the Red, White, and Blue, the Star Spangled Banner, or even the Stars and Stripes. Today, the flag consists of 13 horizontal stripes, seven red, alternating with six white. The stripes represent the original 13 colonies, and the stars represent the 50 states of the Union. The colors of the flag are symbolic as well. Red symbolizes hardiness and valor, while white symbolizes purity and innocence. And then the blue represents vigilance, perseverance, and justice. We call ourselves a union because we are 50 individual states working together as one nation. 
Patrick Henry, in his last public speech, March of 1799, said this, United we stand, divided we fall. In a day where purity, innocence, and justice seem to be lost, I would like us to take a minute to remember the cost of liberty, the cost of freedom, and while the stripes of our banner represent those that started a free nation, the stripes of our Savior save those who believe in him. We need to turn to Jesus, not because our nation needs hope, but because the whole world needs hope. This world needs the God who is Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. I'm going to sing a song that was written by Michael W. Smith remembering our flag and what we went through as a nation on September 11th, 2001. And as I sing about our flag, our national banner, I ask you to pray to Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner, that he will not just heal our land, but all lands. When the night seems to say all hope is lost, gone away, but I know with red of those that died washed in white by the brave in their strength
Hey kids, good Sunday morning. So glad you're with us today, either online or in person. We're standing out front of the church today. You'll probably hear some cars go by here in a moment, but I wanted to look in the book of James today, chapter 1, verse 17. We're going to look at that verse and discuss it for a moment. All right, look with me in verse 17 of James chapter 1. Whatever is good and perfect comes to us from God above, who created all heaven's lights. Unlike them, he never changes or casts shifting shadows. So what do we mean by that? What is going on there? Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. Due to our fallen nature, there's nothing really that's good within us outside of who God the Father is. So God the Father brings and bestows upon us good gifts. We look at this from an eternal standpoint as well. The true value of a gift is how long it lasts. Some of us might have a toy we've played with and it broke really quick or we might have something else and it lasts for that moment and it got us really excited and we enjoyed having it but then it didn't last forever. God gives us a gift that lasts forever through his son Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. So that is the one true perfect gift that we can enjoy and celebrate that we know if we have a relationship with him we can have an eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. The second part of that verse talks about a variance or a shifting of shadows, a change. One thing we know that, that for sure, God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God doesn't age. God doesn't change. We can trust that he will always be the same. God loves us and he wants what is best for us. Hey kids, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. Hey kids, it's time for Jokes with Mr. Derek. I have three jokes for you today. Thing caps on, you can get these. First joke, what's the problem with a nosy pepper? A nosy pepper is jalapeno business. Jalapeno business. All right, the next one. What do you get when you combine a turtle and a porcupine? What do you get when you combine a turtle and a porcupine? A slow poke, a slow poke. <clears throat> That was not that funny. Okay, last one. Um, how do penguins build their houses? How do penguins, or how does a penguin build his house? He glues it together. He glues, he glues it together. He glues. All right, guys, have a great day. God bless you. I mean, seriously, it glues. It glues it together. <laughs> Where does he come up with these? I don't know. <laughs>
Go ahead and turn your Bibles to uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, thank you guys for leading uh, worship and just uh, allowing us to, to ponder uh, there uh, what God has done, what we want him to do. Um, certainly, our land is in a situation that we definitely uh, need healing and restored. Amen? Uh, and so, thank you all for that. As you're turning there, I, I want to think about this message in light of... Uh, the celebration that we just had yesterday and celebrating the nation's birthday. Um, and when I look at this, uh, I really believe whole, holistically. I honestly believe that God is speaking. I believe he's, he's saying something to us. I think he's saying something to the nation. I think he's saying something to the world. I think he's saying something to the church. The fact is he's speaking. Are we listening? Specifically, in the context of where we are in America, are we listening? The pulse, the climate, the, the landscape of America in 2020. You know, it doesn't take long for you to see, hear, listen, before you can see that the very fabric of the nation is fraying uh, and in many cases being torn intentionally. And I'm reminded of Proverbs 14. It says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. Sin condemns any people. When, when you look at the interesting statistics, when I say that God is speaking to us, he's, he's showing us something. He's, he's, I believe he's shooting a, a, a warning shot in many cases. You say, Terry, I... I I'm not so sure. I mean, maybe some of the things that's, that's happening is, is, is needed. Let me give you some statistics. Uh, some interesting statistics that I was able to, to research uh, over the last couple of weeks in pure research. When we look at America, we, we think about her being founded on uh, biblical principles and, and a nation, one nation under God. And these statistics now are for folks who profess to be Christian. This isn't lost people's statistics. This is professing Christ, those who say they believe in the Lord. 41% say they strongly believe in God. 41% of folks that say they strongly believe in God also support same-sex marriage. For y'all that are trying to figure math, that's almost one out of two. That say they strongly believe in the Lord, yet they support something that we know is not of God. Okay? Pretty alarming. 50%, so this is one out of two. The other one was almost one out of two. 50% of the same professing Christians believe homosexuality should be accepted. Views about abortion, you say, Terry, why'd you pick those two? Well, I picked those two because I believe they're important. The sacredness of marriage and the sanctity of life. So you got basically one out of two of professing people to say they strongly believe in the Lord are okay with something that is as anti-God as anything. And then you, you get on the, the, the viewpoint of abortion by those who strongly believe in the Lord. 42% say abortion should be legal in all or most cases. Again, one out of every two. Can I, can I just ask this morning, how could that be if you strongly believe in a Lord that creates life, that one out of every two people that say they strongly believe in the Lord would, would support something that we know is not of God? And so in that context, America, this is the land we live in. I know that there's folks that say, well, we don't need to worry about America. We need to be worried about the world. Yeah, we do, but God's sovereign and allowed each and every one of us to live here. He's not American, but guess what? We are. He ordained us to live here. And we ought to be thankful for that. It troubles me. 
Look, it's, this is not a political speech, but I'll just tell you this. It troubles me. I don't worship the flag, but I will say this. When I see folks burning it or stepping on it, that troubles me. It troubles me because they are stepping on the very, very lives of people that may not have thought about much of the flag either, but they defended it. So you could act the way you act in liberty and freedom. And so when we look at this, America, the people who say they strongly believe in God are supporting, one out of every two, supporting things that are anti-God. And then we wonder, we wonder why America is in the shape that she's in. Could it be that we've forgotten? Could it be that we've forgotten God? Matter of fact, I'm not so sure it's just forgotten him. We're intentionally trying to remove him. But we're trying to remove everything else in history. Let's just go ahead and throw Jesus in there too. God help us. God help us. Y'all all all right? It's going to get gooder. (laughs) Another survey I looked at, percent of those people, this is just the general. Percentage of people in thinking about the state of America, I'm going to have to unbutton my my jacket because it's getting a little warm in here. I might have to take it off in a minute. 71% of those people polled, not believing, this is a separate survey. This is just general people in America. 71% feel a state of anger. Uh, 66% are fearful. Only 46% are hopeful. In a land that rests its existence on Christian principles. Less than half of the folks are hopeful when we serve an almighty God who gives us eternal hope, but yet the majority are living in fear and anger. Doesn't take long when you start looking at things to say, wow, no wonder we're in the shape we're in. I'm going to say it again. Could it be that we have removed or tried to anyway? We, we can't remove him. He can remove himself. That we've tried to remove God. Every age has a personality, by the way. Did y'all know that? Every age has a personality, one usually molded by the experiences of that age. Generations of the last century, we look at World War I and the Great Depression. When we look, start go all the way back to the early 1900s, uh, they, this, this particular generation learned to value family and faith above material possessions because they, they had just come out of a world war, the first world war. World War II, when you look at it, they remained loyal to the nation and institutions that they risked their lives to defend. There was a very prideful bunch that come out of that to say we defended her. And the nation prospered. And then you had Vietnam and the Woodstock and the Watergate age and era where the society learned to challenge authority while chasing material prosperity. And then we look at today's world. Academic postmodernism with its denial of fixed truth and objective ethics. Uh, uh, The society rejects absolutes and, and they prize tolerance. They champion it. As a result, over 60% of young adults who grow up in the church have dropped out. They cite the church's irrelevance, hypocrisy, and the moral failures of its leaders. And while I believe that there's some truth to that, I don't want to put all the onus on the older folks or the older generations because, by the way, we can see some, at least some fruit of the existence of that that older generation, uh, the, the fruit of the younger generation's verdict still out. We got some historical context, so while I don't want to want to deny the fact that the church has, has done much damage 
to her own reputation with the hypocrisy sometimes and the moral failures of his leaders. But this same bunch, this same group of, 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 of I'll call them church dropouts, the younger generation. One third of those young adults left the church because they blamed the church's anti-gay policy. Well, it's not a church anti-gay policy. It's a lordship. It's a written word of God anti-gay policy. I, I didn't make the policy up. Neither did any of the other preachers that preach the word of God. It's in there. It's an abomination before God. So if you left the church because of that, it could be that you're not willing to swallow truth. So I don't put all the onus on the older generation. They share. My generation shares in the problem. But make no mistake, the younger generation's got some skin in the game too. And so with that in mind, we look at this passage. God's speaking. Are we listening? If you're physically able, I want you to stand. Deuteronomy, verse 11 through 19 of chapter 8. I'm actually going to read verse 10 first. They're about to go into the land that God's promised them. He says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, your God, for the good land that he has given you. Praise him. But then the text says here, right after he says, but be careful, be careful that you not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands. Look at there, failing to observe his commands, his laws and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine homes and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all, have multi all of you have multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Out of the land of slavery, he, he led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land when, and when it's venomous snakes and scorpions and he brought you water out of a rock and he gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known to humble and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms the covenant which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come before you, God. God, my heart is burdened. God, as I see you in a pure and perfect love warning us. God, you've been speaking for some time now. I really believe that, God, you've been speaking for some time. God, I pray your people would listen to you. For Lord, we do not want to experience today any time or period a day when you decide not to speak anymore. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. We pray it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. The simple takeaway of this passage is America and the American church need to return to the Lord. We're going to be on the subject of forgetting the Lord today. While you're, while you're there in your Bibles and we look at this portion of God's Word, I want to remind you of the setting of the book of Deuteronomy. It's on, the one, on this side of the Jordan before they go into the land. God promised them, that is, the children of Israel were camped in the plains of Moab, ready to go across the river into the land. Uh, before they went to the land, Moses had some things that he wanted to say to them, and, and, and what he had to say contained, is contained in this book. And we see that America celebrated her 244th birthday yesterday. And we celebrated it in a very unprecedented time. We celebrated it in a much different way. We celebrated it in a way that is very different than we've celebrated in the past. And when you think back through the history of this nation, you, you'll realize that this, this nation's relatively a young nation. It's not an old nation. 
Uh, you, we, we've fairly short history compared to other nations, and I believe in the evaluating the history of the United States. I believe that we can see God's hand upon us. And because his hand is upon us and has been, that's what makes our nation great. It's not our president. It's not our military. It's not our financial systems. It is the Lord that makes us great. And when we, re when we forget him or we try to remove him, we'll re cease to be great. We may still have all the other things. But we won't be great in the Lord's eyes. And here we have Moses' answer sort of to the first great question in politics. What makes a nation prosperous? How does the spiritual decline begin? What is he warning them? They're about to embark on the best journey they've ever embarked on. And so he's warning them. How does the spiritual decline de begin? This passage gives insight, I believe, to us today as it did to the nation of Israel. What has begun the decline of a great nation. And I'm not a gloom and doom guy. I, I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm a glass half full type of guy. I really am. But I'm also a realist. And what I see happening today. Concerns me and burdens me. God's speaking today, are we listening? The first thing we see is when we forget the Lord, forgetting his word will follow. When we forget him, forgetting what his word says will follow. Look, it says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. Look, failing to observe his commands. When you begin to forget who he is, when you forget to remember what he's done for you, soon after that you'll forget what he said. It says, be careful. God tells Israel, be careful not to forget him. America knows intimately that God has not forgotten us. I don't believe he's forgotten us yet. But can I tell you, he's sending us warning after warning after warning. And this nation hadn't seen anything if God takes his hands off of us. You think we're seeing crazy mess now like those folks tearing down stuff, which, by the way, burdens me too. I was taught when I was growing up, if it ain't yours, you don't need to put your hands on it. Some of them folks needed my daddy's hands on them when they was growing up. <laughs> well, it really wasn't his hand, his hand that was holding something. But anyway, I'll let y'all just, your imagination flow a little bit there. The very ground we stand on is a blessing of God. It's not anything that we've done, not anything we've earned. It's what we've been blessed by. Whenever we see the word beware in the Bible, we may be sure that there's something to be aware of. It's not just there to, to pique our curiosity. It's there for a reason. They must be beware lest in all their plenty when they get over there and start enjoying the good life that they forget altogether the Lord, Yahweh. The point was not that men would forget altogether. That was highly unlikely that they would forget altogether. But they would forget their covenant responsibility. Their forgetfulness will be revealed by them not keeping his commandments. It would be revealed by his statues and his ordinance not be taken seriously. We too may still regularly enjoy our attendance at worship, but the test of gen the genuineness of our faith will stand by the way we remember him by our daily lives. That, that's, that was where the rubber met the road. Is They might not holistically altogether forget God. But he'd be so far on the back burners that they'd forget his word. They wouldn't stand for his word. They wouldn't listen to his word. They wouldn't obey his word. It wouldn't be evident of who they belong to in their everyday lives. Notice the word observed there. You'll, you'll forget to observe. You, you won't observe his laws and his statutes. The word comes a Hebrew word. 
It's translated in the scripture by the regard to pay very close attention to. They, when they forgot the Lord, when they put him on the back burner, they would forget, they would neglect, they would not pay very close attention to his word. Is that where we're at in America? We put him so far on the back burner, his word means nothing. That what's supposed to be right and holy is considered wrong and what's wrong is considered right. Could it be we're there? Swimming in those waters? Can I tell you, when you swim in those waters, the stream and the rip currents are dangerous. They'll take you to places you never thought you'd go, possibly even to death. Not just a forgetting. What we're seeing here is an intentional removal of. And I want to warn the American church. Don't make the mistake and don't believe for a minute that when they're trying to cancel everything else, that Jesus Christ and American Christianity will not be the next thing. And let me tell you what they're coming after. The cross and you. You've been forewarned. Agent Rogers said, we, we have in, in God we trust engraved on our money, but we have me first written on our hearts. That's the culture and the climate we're in. A culture and a climate that says, what about me? Why? Because we've forgotten God. And in doing so, we have steadied down the path to where we are forgetting his word as well. God help us as a church and as a nation, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we forget the Lord, forgetting his word will soon follow the second thing we see. When we forget the Lord, ingratitude and pride will follow. Ingratitude, unthankfulness. And pride will follow, will follow. Look there in verse 12 through 18. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine homes and settle down, by the way, they ain't building nothing. The Lord's given that to them. Remember, he promised that to them before they ever got there. But it says, when you build fine houses, settle down with your herds and your flocks grow large, your silver and your gold increase and all you have, have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you'll forget the Lord your God. That's what prosperity does, by the way. We get so entangled in all the things, that, all the glittery and shiny things that we've accumulated, all of a sudden we think we've earned them. It says, then your heart will become proud. You'll forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. By the way, isn't it amazing that God brought them out of the land of slavery? He's about to give them a land that they're going to get. They're going to get in and, and they're going to mess it up. And they're going to do exactly what he says they're going to do if they forget the Lord. And the very things that he freed them from are going to take them back in bondage. Stuff. Did y'all know stuff? You can be a slave to your stuff. Did y'all know that? You can be a slave to your stuff. People with big fine homes and big fancy cars and, and, they, and, and they, they, you don't even, there's a, some, some of them, it's a burden to them to try to keep them paid for. Try to keep them up. Try to, try to. Get furniture in there. I, I, I've, I've been into some homes. And you go in, it's a big home, and I'm like, man, that's a beautiful home. You get in there, it's empty on the inside. They, they house poor. Can't even, can't even furnish it. Ain't but one room got furniture. Stuff can enslave you. It said he led you through the vast and dreadful weirdness, that thirsty and waterless land. With its venomous snakes and scorpions, he brought you water out of a rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, your fathers had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you and you may say to yourself, my power and my strength have produced this wealth for me. When was Israel in danger of forgetting God? It was when she had eaten and was full. It's when she became prosperous, when she arrived, when she 
could say, look at us. It's when her herds and her flocks, her silver and her gold, all that she had had would be multiplied. That's when Israel would be in danger of forgetting. Forgetting God and lifting up herself. Is that where we are in America today? That we have forgotten God and in that not only have we forgotten his word, but we have lifted ourselves up. Look at us. Look at us. We're a circus. The rest of the world is laughing at us. Why would we want anybody to look at us? How strange this seems in danger of forgetting God, though, when you're prosperous. I mean, don't you think you'd remember him? No, because you'd be distracted by all the things in your life. How many there are times are there that we look and we think we're thriving when in all actuality we're really not? The point here is to note that our times of prosperity are our times of danger. Be careful in times of prosperity. Why do you think this passage is repeated, by the way? Uh, we could go right up to the very first part of uh, chapter 8, and he starts off with the same way he, I started in verse 11. Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today that you may live and increase, may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised you. Remember how the Lord your God led. He, he almost repeats himself. Why do you think he repeats himself? Why do you think the Bible over and over and over repeats itself in many ways? Could it be it? Because we got such slippery memories. God knows we're prone to wonder. Prosperity, I wrote this down. Prosperity leads to self-indulgence. Self-indulgence is as dangerous as a knife to the throat. I, saw, I, I wrote this down out of a commentary. Self-indulgence is as dangerous as a knife to the throat. Prosperity tends to lead to the forgetfulness of God. A sense of divine favor dies in the memory. You forget where it come from. You forget who promised you that. That's what he said. Remember, I promised y'all this. When you get over there, don't forget me. I promised y'all this. You haven't earned any of it. I went before you. Prosperity begets pride of the heart. Look, we've seen this through over and over. I mean, Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Herod, all unfortunate examples of it for us. Prosperity tends to breed self-promotion, self-glorification. F.B. Meyer says it this way, it's harder to walk with God in the sunshine of success than in the nipping frost of failure. Be careful when prosperity comes that you don't forget God. When you forget God, you will begin to think that it is you who has done it all. I can't help but pause right here and think of my own personal example. When I re recollect and reflect my own trek, the great terrible wilderness that followed, where there was no water, when my soul was under conviction, the conviction of sin, of, of, of not following God, and the fiery serpents and the scorpions in that desert and the drought that was there in the wilderness. And yet in all of that, he gave me something to drink and fed me spiritual nourishment. 
during that time. That's why I'm thankful. That's why it's harder for me right now in my life, right now at least, thank God that I remember. Forgetting God will cause you to become prideful and you won't be thankful. See, the manna was to teach them the dependence on God taught me the dependence on his word. That's where he fed me, by the way. He gave me spiritual food. It's given when they were hungry and desperate. Can I tell you, when you're hungry and desperate for God, he will never, ever leave you hungry. When you're desperate and hungry for him, he'll feed you. He will. On the authority of this word and my personal experience, I can tell you, he will feed you. And it'll be the best food you ever had. Persecution, sickness, sorrow, darkness, distress seem to drive us to God. The house of mourning proves better than the house of feasting. And God gives us the opportunity to join his work. It's not to be engrossed in our work and to ignore him. See, that's, that's where the church comes in. When we forget God and all of a sudden we think, look at what we've done. Look at the property we have. Look at the building we have. Look at the bank account we have. We haven't earned anything. That's all due to God's favor and doing. Verse 17 says, uh, we have here the idea of a subtle form of idolatry. We're going to get into that. It's not talking about graven images or anything, but you still can have idolatry. It doesn't have to be a certain image. This, this spirit of, uh, that's going to come about when they forget the Lord, the unholy independence spirit, like we did it, It's the prelude to the sure decay of a nation. Nations that think they can do it alone are left to do just that, by the way. When God leaves, they perish too. You, you know what I believe right now? With all my heart, we are watching. We are able to watch with our own eyes the unfolding of Romans 1. Imagine that, that we get a chance to not read it and say, wow, when that time comes, whoa, we're in that time. We're watching it unfold like a movie right before us. And God will not be ignored. Consequences come when nations attempt to remove him. And before you go, Terry, I just don't know if we've tried to remove him. I can just give you like just several examples just right now off the top of my head. Let's see. We removed him from the schoolhouse. We removed him from the courthouse. Uh, in many cases, we've removed him from his own house. We've removed him from his own house. That was three right there just... See me afterwards, you need any more. I can give them to you. You know what I'm reminded of when I think about America and the American church? I'm reminded of the Tower of Babel. Remember that story? Oh, then they said to one another, come let us. Come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. Let's make, let's, let's build us. Let's build our, for ourselves a city and a tower with its tops into the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. We, we can do this. I'm reminded of what Adrian Rogers said. Anything that begins with we 
will end in nothing. Apart from God, we can do nothing. When we forget God, ingratitude, unthankfulness, and pride will follow. The last thing, and I'm done. When we forget the Lord, idolatry will follow. This is sort of the culmination of it all. We start forgetting him. We start forgetting his word. We start being unthankful and prideful. Eventually, idolatry follows. It says, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So, so confirm his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, it is, and worship other gods. And bow down to them. And listen, they ain't nothing I'm bowing down to but the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't care who asks me. Don't care who tells me. I'm only bowing down to the only one that's worthy of being bowed down to. Jesus. Y'all all right? Y'all all right online? I hear you. Y'all all right in the sanctuary? I ain't heard nothing from up there. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you. See, this is the holy, righteous judgment of God. Don't think for a minute that he'll treat us differently than he'll treat anybody else. When you go against him, there's consequences. He didn't have any favorite kids. There's consequences when we disobey. And he says, listen, if you go like the other nations go, you'll get what the other nations got. I don't know if that was proper English, Jimmy. But I, I think it'll preach. Charles Spurgeon said, if you sin as they do, you shall fare as they do. That he may establish his covenant, it says. This reminds us of why God has blessed us. His plan is that we would ultimately further his eternal purpose. Therefore, we have no right to use our material blessings to further selfish purposes. Instead, we are to use our resources to advance his kingdom. Verse 18 through 20, let them, however, beware the alternative route, the route of idolatry and flagrant disobedience. This warning may seem to come somewhat abruptly in the text, but it really doesn't if you read the whole thing. He's warning them all along. He just tells them at the end, you're going to get it if you disobey and you forget God. Understand there's, there's consequences to choices. See, the danger of succumbing to the gods of the land was ever present in Moses' mind. That's why I love the leaders in the Bible and the ones that are chosen and God-filled and spirit-led. Moses knew what would happen. He knew that they could succumb, and once they, got, they saw all that glitter and glamour, and he said, I cannot help but to warn them. Because he loved them. Because he loved them. That's why it's so important with truth and love. I can speak truth all day long, but if I don't love you in speaking, it's probably going to sound like a gong and a cymbal. And, and if, I, if, I, if I love you all day long, but I don't speak truth to you, I'm lying to you. Truth and love. And by the way, don't think for a minute that truth and love is all of a sudden going to fix everything. Because the one who exhibited and expressed those things perfectly, love, Jesus Christ, I believe, demonstrated perfect love on the cross. And he said himself, I am the truth. So the one who expressed perfectly truth and love was rejected. So understand, when you speak truth and love, don't think that everybody's going to be okay with that. 
One word we said this, an ungrateful heart can become quickly a haven for all sorts of sinful attitudes and appetites that cater to the flesh. Moses warned them, the same judgment will rest upon the nation of Israel. Can I, can I share with you just application wise? The same judgment can rest upon America. Let me lean in just a little bit closer to you. The same judgment can rest upon the American church. Let me see if I can lean a little further. I don't want to get outside the view here. The same judgment can rest upon your own family. Forgetting God leads to ingratitude, which leads to self-sufficiency, which leads to idolatry, which ends in destruction. I'm going to say this, and I'm done. Adrian Rogers said one time, to think that Washington is going to be the answer to the world's problems is like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. The gospel is the only thing that fixes I said that last week. It's not a gospel and or a gospel plus or a gospel minus. It's just simply the gospel. And by the way, if the gospel, if the gospel does what it says it does and it does, that was good right there. I used does like three times and didn't mess it up, Jimmy. It covers all. I believe the Bible says it covers all sin. Well, if it covers all sin, then it covers the sin of racism. It covers the sin of idolatry. It covers the sin of prejudice. It covers the sin of, 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 of anything in the Bible that's labeled sin. It covers it. It washes it. It redeems it. You can't have restoration unless it's redeemed. And the only thing that redeems is the blood. Anything else that fixes it will be a temporary fix. And eventually to rear its ugly head again. The blood is what washes. And only the blood. And America's trying to fix America's problems without the blood of Jesus Christ. And all that's going to create is more problems. It's the blood. Thank God for the blood. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, as we bow before your throne, Lord, this message has been a hard one, Lord. A hard one to grasp, a hard one to swallow. But God, I thank you for your medicine. I thank you for the medicine of the heart. That your word is a double-edged sword, Lord. It cuts and it heals at the same time. God, we thank you for that. And God, I thank you that even in the midst of the chaos, as I said last week, Jesus Christ can be at the very center of it. He, he can be the one that we, we, we anchor to. He can be the anchor that holds us during this until the storms pass by. And we look around and we say, Lord, you kept us safe again. God, we as a nation, America, repent. God, we repent because we've forgotten you. And in forgetting you, we've forgotten your word and hadn't obeyed it. We become self-sufficient and prideful. And God, we've allowed idols to be worshipped. God, we repent. God, as the American church, we do likewise. When we've forgotten you, massaged your word, made it palatable, we've become self sufficient. We've looked around and beat our chests and said, look at us. And we've let idolatry creep in. God, we repent. 
God, for myself, can't speak for others. I can speak for myself, Lord, I repent. The seasons I forgot you and then not followed your word, become self-sufficient, prideful, unthankful, and then allowed little gods, little G's to creep into my life. I repent. God, there may be one right now listening to the sound of my voice, either here, sanctuary, online. And they've come to the realization that they've never knew God, let, let alone forgot him. They've never knew him. But God, you've worked in their heart this morning. They've seen that Jesus is enough. He's the only one that saves. He's the only one that can cleanse unrighteousness. He's the only one that can give us the right standing before the Father. And they've realized that they've sinned against the Holy God in need to be in right standing. And only through Jesus Christ, his shed blood on the cross and his glorious resurrection that gives new life. And they've come to a saving knowledge this morning. If that's you, I just simply ask you right now where you are to bow your head and just say this prayer, Lord Jesus, I know I need you. Apart from you, I am on my way to hell. Apart from you, I am going to live a life for as long as you will allow me to be on this earth, a life of misery without joy and full of strife. But Lord, I know because of Jesus, because of you, you had me on your heart and mind when you went to the cross and you died for my sins to be forgiven. Your blood washes me clean, white as snow. Lord, come into my heart and my life and save me and change me today. If you said that prayer, I want to know about it. I want you to let us know. Let me know. My email is pastorterry3 at gmail.com. Let the staff know. We want to know that you made the single most important decision in your life this morning. Please let us know. We want to rejoice with you. For many of you, you're sitting there and maybe you're just silent. If you're like me over the last three weeks, this, this sermon hit me like a ton of bricks. And you're speechless. Simply bow your head and say, Lori, Lord, two words, I'm sorry. Two words, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And God, give me the strength. Thank you for your restoration, God. If that's you, I'd love to know that as well. I love to hear stories about God working. It encourages my heart like nothing else to see God working in the hearts and lives of people. Lord, we desire nothing more than to see your presence real in our lives. And God, as we bow before you in closing, Lord, for our nation, for our church, and for our families, God, make us ever mindful of who you are. God, make us ever mindful of what you've done. And God, make us ever mindful that you are coming again. Lord, give us the urgency to share the greatest story ever told, the story of you redeeming mankind. Lord, it is our only hope, and we place our hope in you. We love you, and we praise your holy name. Amen. Well, we thank you for being with us today and look forward to seeing your bright and shiny face.